is Britain's best-known fighter aircraft, the Spitfire. We Americans in Britain know the Spitfire. We've seen it in action. Many of us have flown it in action. Believe me, the Spitfire has got what it takes. During the Battle of Britain, a mere handful of hurricanes and Spitfires worked with Britain's anti-aircraft command. And between them, they knocked all hell out of the Nazis. Stop them, Spitfire! In three short months, during daylight, 2,375 would-be invaders found the last resting place in the waters of the English Channel or in England's green fields. By bitter experience, Nazi pilots learned to know the Spitfire shape. And the average Britisher knew and welcomed the Spitfire sound. In every war zone, Spitfires went into action. Over the Mediterranean from Gibraltar. Crete. Malta. Over the Pacific from Australian bases. And over Burma from bases in India. Then came D-Day. The Festung Europa, Hitler's European fortress, began to crumble. And again, Spitfires were on the job in overwhelming force. They were among the first Allied aircraft to land on the soil of liberated France. And soon they were in the air again, pressing home the attack. Many Spitfires were equipped for special tasks. Some for photo reconnaissance work. some for bombing on special missions. And in 1944, Spitfire pilots had an assignment after their own hearts. The Battle of Southern England was on. Hundreds of flying bombs fell to the cannon of Spitfire interceptors. All this time, the Royal Navy's carrier-based Spitfires, known as Sea Fires, were hitting the enemy from the sea. These sea fires are playing a leading role in the drama of world events today. They came into the limelight with a smash hit, the first Allied victory in Italy. And it was in Italy that the story of the Spitfire really began. Here, 16 years earlier, a peaceful victory was won for Britain by supermarine monoplanes. Listen to this story of the evolution of the Spitfire. It's the simple story of a great job of work. In 1927, the RAF won the Schneider Trophy Contest for the first time with S-5. In 1929, S-6 was the winner, the first aircraft in the world to exceed 400 miles an hour. The final victory was gained by the S-6B in 1931. And this victory meant a great deal more than the mere winning of an ornate silver trophy. Here was the basic design from which the modern Spitfire was created. Clean lines and tremendous engine power. These ideals found expression on the drawing board under the expert eye of the late R.J. Mitchell. And from the design of the S-6B, a powerful land-based fighter began to develop. Other famous designers carried on in the footsteps of Mitchell, tackling each fresh problem with the basic principles of the design always in mind. At first, the designers considered an elliptical wing shape, but for ease of production, the leading edge was reshaped and became slightly straighter. The problem of fitting the Merlin engine with its oil tank below was solved by giving the nose a pigeon-breasted effect. 
Then they had to decide where to put the radiator. Eventually it was mounted under the starboard wing. The designers thought that this might help to counteract the torque of the air screw. Upon this simple design, all later Spitfires were modelled. Here is that distinctive shape, easily recognised by everyone who has seen the Spitfire in action. You can see how that shape is built up. The fuselage has a clean, straight top. The fin and rudder is small and well-rounded, and the slight curve of the underside is broken only by the radiator. There's the pigeon-breasted effect, accentuated by the short nose, and finally the almost elliptical wings. That's the basic Spitfire shape, and the effectiveness of this clean design has been proved again and again. They're fast and easy to manoeuvre, everything that a first-class fighter should be. As the war went on, the tactics of aerial combat changed. The need for specialised fighter aircraft became more urgent. First, extra armament was needed. The lines of Spitfire I remained unchanged in the next important mark, but cannon were added, originally four, but later usually two. And so Spitfire V appeared, armed with the extra firepower needed for the job. Later, the wings of the Mark V were clipped to give better manoeuvrability at low altitudes. That's how the present Spitfire V was evolved. She's essentially the same as Spitfires I and II, but for the squared off wingtips and most versions will be seen with cannon mounted on the wings. Clipped wings were successful for low altitude work but often dogfights are fought out at considerable heights. For this high altitude work, sharply pointed wingtips were added, and among other marks, Spitfire 7 appeared. The pointed wingtips are strikingly different, and you can't fail to spot this type from any angle. Meanwhile, the designers were tackling new problems. More speed was demanded, and more changes in design had to be made when the Merlin 61 engine was fitted. A longer nose was built to accommodate this new engine and its two-stage supercharger and intercooler. The pigeon breast began to disappear. The new engine needed an extra radiator, and this was fitted under the port wing. These are the features which make up Spitfire 9. Spitfire 8 has the same features, but there are just two points of difference between these two marks. Mark 8 has a pointed rudder to give extra stability, and the tail wheel is retractable. But the Mark 9 has the original rounded fin and rudder, and the tail wheel is fixed. When you see the 9 in action, you'll notice all the familiar Spitfire features. The wing shape, the curved underside and small fin and rudder, and don't forget the new features the longer nose with the pigeon breast beginning to disappear, and the two symmetrical radiators. That's the Mark IX. While these newer Spitfires carried on with the good work, more developments were taking shape on the drawing board. Greater engine power is always in demand, and in the Mark VIII, we saw that an attempt was made to increase stability by increasing the rudder area. This was successful, but in the Mark XIV, a completely redesigned fin and rudder was essential, for the Mark XIV had an even more powerful Rolls-Griffin engine, also with a two-stage supercharger and intercooler. To accommodate this new engine and its intercooler, the nose was lengthened again and a bigger spinner was needed. The nose curved down slightly to the spinner, the pigeon-breasted effect now almost disappeared, 
and of course with the more powerful engine the two radiators had to be enlarged. So that's Spitfire 14. She's slightly larger and even faster than her predecessors and was designed to meet the constant demand for more speed. Let's watch the 14 in action. For Europe's D-Day, this new fighter put on war paint. But even without the war paint, they knew her over there by the familiar Spitfire shape. Look for the larger spinner and longer nose, the new fin and rudder and the bigger radiators, in this case with a drop tank in between, and you'll know that this one is Spitfire 14. Let's go back to the drawing board. From Spitfire 14, another development soon followed, and another mark was added to the long list of Spitfire types, Mark 21. This time, the wing was redesigned. Its taper and the clipped tip make it easy to pick out, and four cannon are mounted on the wings. Except for the wing, the 21 is essentially the same as the 14. Watch the 21 in action, and the first thing you'll notice is the new wing shape. The long nose and the large tail unit are both identical with the 14. Finally, you'll see the four cannon, the normal armament of the newer Spitfire type, Mark 21. During the war, these fighters have been developed to meet the needs of the moment. Already, new carrier-based sea fires are upholding the Spitfire tradition in many theatres of war. Spitfires and sea fires have been developing along parallel lines, and here's one of the newest sea fires, Sea Fire 15, adapted for its special work with the Royal Navy. Straight away, you'll notice many of the Spitfire recognition features you've heard about already. There's the pointed fin and rudder, like Spitfire 8, and there's the long nose, designed to take the Griffin engine. Seafire 15 has two radiators, like all the later Spitfires. But here's something new, a blister cockpit cover, which has meant redesigning the top of the fuselage behind it. You can see what a difference it makes, especially when combined with the slight droop of the Griffin engine nose. This new cockpit cover won't be seen on all Seafire 15s, but nearly all future Seafires and Spitfires will have it. on, and as our operations spread and grow in intensity, other Spitfires and Seafires may appear on the battlefronts of the world. But the basic characteristics will still be there. Remember the original Spitfire features, and you'll always recognize the new marks. That's the story of the Spitfire. Just as they knocked hell out of the Nazis in the Battle of Britain and after, Spitfires and Seafires are now ready to knock hell out of the Japs. And the newer Spitfires are Spitfires Plus. We'll know the Spitfire types now wherever we meet them. For a final checkup, here are the most important marks once more. Spitfire 1. Spitfire 5. Spitfire 9, the 14, the 21, and Seafire 50. Whether you can remember each separate mark or not, you can't go wrong. They're all unmistakably of the Spitfire breed.
deservedly the best known fighters in the world